We all know what it's like to feel stressed, and we all deal with it differently. A demanding life event may have a substantial physical and psychological impact on one person, while an apparently identical event is not disturbing for another. For example, we all make the same exam at the end of January. One might gain a couple of pounds, one might lose a couple of pounds. One might fight a lot, and one might isolate themselves for the entire week. The effects of stress are dependent on your coping style. Stress doesn't only occur in university, but might also occur at your future workplace. In the Netherlands, 17% of working people experiences burnout symptoms. Therefore, it is important to know how you can deal with stress in the right way. These researchers investigated the efficacy of an intensive approach to stress reduction and coping enhancement. This approach was tested on senior managers. Why did they want to test this on senior managers, you may ask? There's almost no research that focused on senior managers, even though the health status of managers can affect a large number of workers. Although stress is a frequently studied subject, existing stress studies got a lot of criticism. For example, no follow-up of the interventions, short-term studies of less than six months, too few subjects and too little time to spend on an intervention. This study wants to address many of the shortfalls of previous studies. They developed a three and a half day workshop for senior managers, which involved several kinds of psychological and physical activities. The stress and coping inventory was used to assess different dimensions of stress and coping among the participants. Two different hypotheses were tested. The first hypothesis was about the effectiveness of the workshop format, whereas SEI scores were expected to be improved after the workshop and thus positive changes in stress and coping styles were expected. The second hypothesis tested was additional to the first one and expected that work satisfaction would improve given that participants developed effective skills to cope with stress. In the study, 95 US governmental senior managers participated in a 35-hour stress management retreat. Eight workshops were offered from 1992 through 1996. Each workshop had 12 participants on average. Most participants were self-selected, others were encouraged to attend by a supervisor or a friend at the workplace. For all workshop attendees, a pre-SEI was administered by mail one month prior to the workshop date. Post-SEIs were returned by participants approximately 10 months following the workshop. Eight different dimensions of coping and stress were assessed. The four coping skills included health habits, social support, responses to stress, and life satisfactions. The four stress indicators were developmental background, recent life changes, recent health, and behaviors and emotions. The total score of SEI represented a person's balance between coping and stress and is therefore referred to as the global balance score. This total score is obtained by subtracting the total score for all four stress indicators from the total score for all four coping abilities. 83 participants completed both pre- and post-SEI assessment. 77% of this group was male and 23% was female. The mean age was approximately 46 years old. The stress intervention workshops were held at four different sites across the United States. A key factor was that all attendees were required to be on site throughout the workshop. The daily program started at 7 o'clock with mind-body exercise such as yoga, tai chi, or a walk one. During the morning session, starting from 9 o'clock, specific stress and coping topics were introduced in small breakout groups. Topics included were, for instance, stress response, social support, life satisfaction, and work stresses. Afternoon sessions included team building activities. Specific activities varied by site, but the main goal was to increase trust. Active participation was by choice, but each participant was asked to find a way to be active in the group. In the evening, one-on-one -on -one sessions were held to discuss individual issues in confidence. Also, small group relaxation training was given. 
The final focus of the workshop was to craft individual action plans for creating a healthier lifestyle across the next year. The daily program ended at half past nine. Paired t-tests for pre- and post-SCI changes were computed using SBSS for the stress and coping skills. Participants showed significant improvements in their overall global balance scores, psychological symptoms, depression symptoms and all major coping skills. Global balance scores range from a worst of minus 12 to a best of plus 12. A higher positive score indicates a better balance. The mean global balance scores improved by more than one full point. As you can see, from 0.5 to 1.6, this was a significant change. The primary hypothesis that the workshop program was an effective method of stress intervention is thus confirmed. Of all stress skills, only two of the recent health stress subskills showed significant results, which we indicated with a pink arrow. The other stress skills, developmental background, recent life changes and behaviors and emotions, did not show significant changes. All four coping dimensions, and consequently the overall coping score, showed significant improvements. This is indicated with a green arrow. When we look at the subscales of the coping measure life satisfactions, we can see that work satisfaction improved. This means that the second hypothesis that participants' work satisfaction scores would improve was upheld. They also performed a post hoc analysis on the stress and coping pre- and post-SCI scores. They compared individuals who showed high versus low levels of stress in the pre-SCI. The mean global balance score was used as the criterion to form the two groups. Paired t-tests showed that the high stress group had significant improvements in both stress and coping. The low stress group showed significant improvements in their coping scores only. Participant evaluation data revealed that the various aspects of the workshop experience were highly valued with a 4.6 on a scale from 1 as poor to 5 as excellent. In conclusion, we can say that both hypotheses were confirmed. An intensive, multifaceted approach to stress intervention is a viable option for encouraging sustained behavioral change. Participants really liked the workshops and participants' behavioral satisfaction changed positively. However, there were a few shortfalls to the study, which may be addressed in future stress studies. First of all, the used approach was not systematically explored. Time durations differed from a half to four days. They did experience that a longer, more intense format with a duration of at least three days produced the best results. However, not all results were obtained with the use of a three and a half day approach. The other shortfall was the missing control group. The effectiveness of the findings could therefore not be fully verified. The researchers therefore suggest future stress studies to involve the intensive format utilizing at least a three-day period, a control group, and in order to further strengthen the workshop evaluation process, also use more objective measures of physiological health. These are measures such as blood pressure, laboratory data, and physical fitness level. One of the implications of the study arises from an unanticipated result that was found during the follow-up. That was post-workshop networking among the participants. Since many managers felt unable to openly discuss stressful issues with persons they were supervising, they had little social support at the office. After the workshop, many reported contacting the workshop colleagues to discuss work and personal issues. In the end, the current format provides an effective mechanism for enhancing your stress and coping skills. So, when you are stressed for your exam in January, working on your stress and coping skills might help you to get a good grade. Welcome to this e-lecture. The study which we are going to present was conducted by Howard Tang in Austin in 2015 and is about teaching critical thinking skills and ability motivation intervention plus the Pygmalion effect. In a broader context, occupational health psychology has its focus on the creation of healthy workplaces in which people may produce, serve, grow, and be valued. Within this vision, healthy workplaces are understood to be ones where people use their talents, gifts, and knowledge, skills, abilities to achieve high performance, high satisfaction, and well-being. Critical thinking is part of an important skill set as it is associated with academic success and less negative real-world life events. First of all, we are going to address existing literature. Scholars have tried to identify individual differences, approaches, motivational variables, 
training methods, and learning culture to improve critical thinking skills. But very little research has examined the effect of case-based critical thinking module on students' critical thinking skills at the undergraduate level. The sixth higher taxonomy of cognitive complexity created by Bloom et al. and revised by Anderson and Gradwell contains the following six verbs. Remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. The majority of students focuses on the first three parts of this cognitive complexity. However, as critical thinking depends on the three more advanced parts, Howard, Tang, and Austin concentrated on analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Therefore, the aim of this study was to explore the effect of case-based critical thinking module on university students' critical thinking skills. We're now going to talk about the topic and the research questions in more detail. But what is critical thinking? Critical thinking is the process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and or evaluating information. This information can be gathered, for example, by observation or experience. Critical thinking reinforces the problem-solving ability. The best predictor of future performance is past performance, and people with high abilities are more likely to improve their performance than those without. Since expertise contributes to improvements in critical thinking skills, Howard, Tang, and Austin chose to deal with the university students. They focus on two objective measures, ACT and GPA. The ACT is a curriculum-based measure for college admission, reflecting students' abilities, achievements, and academic performance, which contribute to critical thinking skills. The GPA also reflects students' cumulative academic achievements and success. Accordingly, students with high ACT and GPA are more likely to improve their critical thinking skills than those without. Consequently, they formulated these hypotheses. As we said before, the first aim of the study was to explore the effect of case-based critical thinking module on university students' critical thinking skills. The second aim was to explore within subject changes in students' CTA scores from pre-test to post-test. And the third aim was to identify students' abilities and motivational factors that contribute to these changes in CTA. Let's now look at the research design and methods. The study was conducted at a regional state university in the States with 659 undergraduate business students from which 390 were male and 247 were female. Most of the students were Caucasian. Using a Salomon Four Group design, they investigated the effect of a case-based critical thinking intervention on students' critical thinking skills. They randomly assigned 31 sessions of business classes to four groups and collected data from three sources during two semesters about in-class performance, so critical thinking abilities, university records, which means ACT for math, English, reading and composite, GPA and demographic variables, and internet online surveys about learning and motivational goals, learning modalities, values, and learning styles. The Salomon for group design involves a pretest for groups one and two. The pretest stimulates both students and professors and influences their response to the post-test. In order to investigate within subject changes, they assigned more sessions randomly to groups 1 and 2. The Salomon for group design allows to investigate between subject differences. They turn to within subject changes and investigated factors that contribute to students' changes from the pre to the post test. Groups 1 and 3 used a case study as an intervention to enhance their critical thinking skills. Groups 2 and 4 stayed without intervention. But some students may have experienced the case study method in other courses. It's important to state that students from groups 1 and 3 had their critical thinking model as part of their total semester grade, but participants from groups 2 and 4 volunteered to participate in the study. Professors were asked to teach their classes in a normal manner, except for the intervention and or additional CTA measures. The objective of the critical thinking module was to help students understand the discipline and the logic of critical thinking. It demonstrates how to build defensible and rational conclusions and fulfill the assignment. This offers opportunities for reflection, collaboration, and critical questioning. Also part of the intervention was the setting of SMART goals to enhance people's performance through the Pygmalion effect and the Galatea effect. These two effects can be considered as a priming effect that changes one's behavior. 
Priming can be used as the creation of subconscious goals. For example, when working adults were primed by a backdrop photograph of a woman winning a race, they wrote significantly more ideas for brainstorming tasks than those without. As a measure, they adopted a 40-item short-form Watson Glaser critical thinking appraisal. This tool measures an individual's ability to digest information and understand situations. We are now going to present the study's results. All ACT scores were significantly related to students' pre-test and post-test scores and total GPA. Pre-test scores were significantly related to post-test scores, supporting the reliability of CTA in general. Male students tended to have a lower GPA but higher pre-test scores than females, and white students tended to have higher ACT scores and pre-test and post-test scores than their non-white counterparts. Older students tended to have lower ACT scores and higher total credit hours than their younger counterparts. They investigated five object variables across four groups using a multivariate analysis of variance and found no significant differences across four groups. Let's now connect the results to the hypotheses. First, they looked at between subject differences. Therefore, they applied it 2 times 2 ANOVA with the following design. As a quick reminder, the first objective was to explore the effects of an intervention at the pretest on university business students' critical thinking school. However, the results did not support hypothesis 1. There is no between subject difference in the study. The two main effects of the case based intervention at pretest, as well as the interaction effect, have no significant impact on the critical thinking score at the end of the semester. In the second step, they looked at within subject changes from pretest to post test. Here you can see the results of a paired samples t test. Significant within subject changes show that students improved their critical thinking skills from pretest to post test with or without the case based critical thinking module. With or without the intervention, both female and white students improved their critical thinking scores, but their male and non-white counterparts do not. Critical thinking skills depend on both ability and motivation in a given situation. Those who have high performance goals improve their CTA scores from time 1 to time 2. In other words, this means that the results supported the hypothesis 2. In the last step, the authors looked at factors that contribute to changes of critical thinking skills. Results for group 1, which was the group with the intervention, showed that both age and ACT were significantly related to pre- and post-test. Gender was only related to the pre-test, and the pre-test was significantly related to the post-test. Group 2, so the group without intervention, showed that age and ACT were both related to the pre-test and the post-test. GPA was only related to the post-test. A pairwise comparison of the parameters of the pre-test to post-test relationship for groups 1 and 2 showed that the difference approached significance. Thus, the relationship between the pre-test and the post-test is slightly higher for group 2 than for group 1. So taken together, results in this section supported hypothesis 3. Based on the mentioned results, we are now going to discuss possible implications of the study. Hereby you can find the overview of the results. The results support the theories of goal setting and self-efficacy. Professors, parents and executives must expect students and employees to succeed in academic or organizational settings. Eden and Ryan stated, if you expect success, your likelihood of achieving it is increased. You become a prophet who can fulfill your own prophecy. And this also works in the opposite direction, so don't expect to fail. It is also important to provide counseling in schools and organizations to enhance self-esteem and self-efficacy. People are influenced by their external environment and learning culture in organizations. Scholars and professionals may practice the Pygmalion and Galatea effect, set a visual smart goal and apply techniques such as a backdrop photograph of a woman winning a race, to boost employees' self-efficacy, performance, and solve real work-related problems.
in the competitive world of work, educators, managers and practitioners must increase their awareness of critical thinking skills, foster work environment stimulants, set higher goals, motivate all individuals to perform better and improve their critical thinking skills. It helps with communication, teamwork, negotiation, persuasion and problem solving. Critical thinking is part of a process known as cognitive crafting. Cognitive crafting is reframing how one views one's role. Thanks to critical thinking skills, individuals may reframe the tasks they had to complete. As a result, cognitive crafting changes the boundaries of how individuals see their jobs. Here we would like to refer to job crafting. Job crafting is a voluntary self-initiated employee behavior targeted as seeking resources, seeking challenges and reducing demands. While resources enhance employee work motivation, demands impair employee health or enhance motivation when perceived as challenges. According to a study from Tim Spacker and Dirks, an increase in job resources was positively related to employee well-being, so increased engagement, job satisfaction and decreased burnout. Employee job crafting has a positive impact on well-being and employees therefore should be offered opportunities to craft their own jobs. Lastly, we would like to present the study's limitations. One of the limitations could be the students' behavioral patterns that may be different from full-time employees. Also, there wasn't a big demographical variability. The content of the intervention was not exactly the same due to different course materials. The non-significant between subject differences might be caused by students' exposure to the case studies in other courses already. Thank you very much for your attention. Welcome. This is an e-lecture on the article of Van den Heuvel, de Maruti and Peters from 2015 titled The Job Crafting Intervention – Effects on Job Resources, Self-Efficacy and Effective Well-Being. The study follows a real job crafting intervention that was conducted by the researchers in the Netherlands. Job crafting is defined as the physical and cognitive changes individuals make in the task or re relational boundaries of their work. This definition identifies three changeable aspects of work. First, task aspect that deals with changing the number and types of tasks one does. Second, cognitive aspect that looks at how employees cognitively frame the significance of their work. And thirdly, relational boundaries refer to how people can change how they interact with others. The theory deals with two main frameworks. First, the job demands resources model. The job demands resources model is about job resources and job demands. Job crafting has been integrated in the model as specific behavior. Employees can increase their job resources, which is done by asking for help or advice. Employees can seek challenging demands, which entails them asking for more responsibilities or challenges to keep them active on the job in a positive way. Or employees can reduce job demands, which allows them to change the mental and physical aspects of their job to suit them better. The aim of the intervention is to teach employees how to describe their jobs in terms of demands and resources and how job crafting behaviors aids changing job aspects to improve their well-being. In addition, the intervention utilizes the social cognitive theory to emphasize the social learning process which is established by having talks to colleagues, asking for feedback from supervisors, reflecting on their own behavior and setting realistic, attainable goals based on all this information as part of the intervention. This leads to four hypotheses. The first one deals with being able to change work environment by building job resources. Two specific resources are identified. Firstly, opportunities for development. This refers to the increased need for employees to increase their own employability and create opportunities for themselves by actively seeking them out. The intervention does this by encouraging to reflect on developmental needs as well as simply engaging in job crafting, which stimulates engaging in new actions and behavior which may reveal opportunities as you search for them more. The second resource is the Leader Member Exchange, also known as LMX. This resource refers to the quality of the relationship between employee and leader or supervisor. The intervention promotes building resources by teaching employees to ask for support or feedback from their supervisors to increase their own resources. In doing so, supervisors also see their employees as more proactive and effective, which leads to a better relationship. Therefore, Hypothesis 1 states that employees participating in job crafting intervention will experience higher levels of opportunities for development and LMX after the intervention compared to with employees in the control group.
The second hypothesis deals with work-related self-efficacy. The benefits from having self-efficacy are obvious. And according to SCT, there are three strategies to increase it, and these can be seen throughout the intervention. Number one, role modeling, which means learning from other people's successful behaviors and views and integrating them in your personal job crafting plan. Number two, verbal persuasion, promoting to use statements, feedback and encouragement from others, such as your supervisor, to set realistic and proper goals. And the last one, mastery experiences, which is making larger goals more realistic and attainable. That in itself is motivating and increases a sense of accomplishment once you attain those goals. Therefore, we expect hypothesis two that employees participating in the job crafting intervention will experience higher levels of self-efficacy after the intervention than employees in the control group. Furthermore, the current study expects that the intervention will stimulate work-related well-being, which is divided in positive and negative affective reactions. Setting realistic and attainable goals is crucial for the intervention, as well as allowing for time to reflect on what that has been accomplished. Those two things are expected to elicit more positive and less negative effects in the employees in regard to their own performance. Thus, the third hypothesis reads, employees participating in the job crafting intervention will experience higher levels of positive effect and lower levels of negative effect at the follow-up than employees from the control group. And lastly, the process of how job crafting is related to resources and well-being in the short term. The intervention spans multiple weeks and it is interesting to track the development process of individuals over that span. To keep track of the individual progress participants write down their job crafting experience in a diary report. The researchers expect that the level of active job crafting may vary from week to week. Therefore, in weeks employees actively engage in job crafting, they will perceive more resources, less demands and seek more challenges. So, the fourth hypothesis reads... Weekly job crafting will be positively related to a weekly level of opportunities for development, LMX, self-efficacy, and positive effect and negatively related to negative effect. Continuing with the methodology, the study has a quasi-experimental design with measurements at two time points. At time point one, participants filled out a pre-measurement survey, and at second time point, which was one to two weeks after the intervention had ended, they filled out a post-measurement survey and received a feedback report. They also kept track of the aforementioned diary report in between these time points. The experimental group consisted of 39 employees who completed the each requirement at time point two, and the control group consisted of 47 people and had to fill out the same pre- and post-intervention surveys without actually participating in the activities. As for the demographics, we made a simple table, which is on the screen now, and you can pause the screen if you want to see them properly. Now onto the intervention design itself. It kicked off with a training day that elaborated on the theory of the job demands and resources model and what job crafting itself entails. During this session, they also wrote down their task demands and resources on a poster, which allowed them to identify the situations at work in which they wanted to job craft. In addition, they also made a specific job crafting goals plan with goals such as how to seek resources, how to reduce demands or how to seek challenges. And at the end of each job crafting week, the participants had planned time to reflect on their progress and achievements and made some commitments for the upcoming week with smaller goals on what to improve upon during the job crafting activities. And in the closing reflection session, they shared their job crafting experiences with one another. And now on to the last part of the methodology, the variables have been covered in the theory section already, so I won't name them again, but they will be on screen now. And as for the analysis strategy, most are probably familiar except for the multi-level analysis. A multi-level analysis is used to account for the weekly measures on job crafting behavior of the individuals and the five predictors we mentioned above. You will see how that works out in the results section, but it's important to note. Now on to the results. Firstly, we'll look at the results from the repeated measures ANOVA in Table 2. It was found that the intervention group did not show higher levels of seeking resources, nor did they seek more challenge demands, or sought to reduce any demands after the intervention was over when comparing them to the control group. Additionally, the results indicate that the intervention group report less negative effect, higher self-efficacy, higher developmental opportunities and better LMX after the intervention, 
However, these results are not significant either, which means that there was no significant changes in the variables during the period of the intervention. Practically, this means that hypotheses 1 and 2 are rejected through the repeated measures ANOVA. However, the t-test does provide support for hypotheses 1a and 1b, which respectively expected higher levels of opportunities for development and leader membership exchange, as well as supporting hypotheses 2, stating the intervention group would experience higher levels of self-efficacy, and confirmed hypothesis 3b, which said that participants would experience lower levels of negative effect. Concluding the results with hypothesis 4, which utilized the multi-level approach we alluded to earlier in the method section, and as you can see with hypothesis 4 now, it accounts for the weekly variation of the job crafting behaviors, which were seeking resources, seeking challenges, and reducing demands, and the weekly variation of the five predictors that are influenced by these job crafting behaviors. The data was pulled from the diaries that the participants had to fill out each week. The results showed that weekly levels of seeking resources were positively related to weekly levels of developmental opportunities, LMX, and positive effect. Also, reducing demands was also positively related to weekly positive effect. Therefore, we found support for hypotheses 4A, 4B, and 4D, which expected positive relationships of job crafting to opportunities for development, LMX, and positive effect. However, we found no effects of weekly job crafting on weekly self-efficacy or on weekly negative effect, which were the hypotheses 4C and 4E. And now for the discussion. The results just shown show support for most of the hypotheses, but it should be noted that these findings were not detected using the RM NOVA, which considers both the intervention and the control group simultaneously, but instead with the test of the intervention group data. Therefore, Results are preliminary and should be interpreted with caution. In this sense, the study can be regarded as a pilot study and more research is needed to confirm the effectiveness of the job crafting intervention. A number of limitations must be mentioned. First of all, our sample size was modest and the study has insufficient statistical power to, due to the small sample size. The limited statistical power uh, may have restricted the significance of some analyses. Further, our sample size uh, consisted of only one vocational group, which limits the generali generalizability of the results. The intervention should be therefore be repeated in other occup occupational contexts. Also, the intervention consisted of different components. The effect of the different components are difficult to study separately, as our design was created to measure the effects of the intervention as a whole. We live in an era where self-management in every part of life seems to become the norm. This is also true for organizations, where the need for proactive employees is growing more than ever. Therefore, an intervention like the one we described in the study may be a very important tool to help individuals become better self-managers at work. This study is the first study to test bottom-up job crafting intervention within the police work setting and to show that participants can learn to build resources, self-efficacy and effective well-being in their work. The intervention needs further testing and development but seems to hold real potential to create improvement in these areas.